Hi there, friends. Welcome to another episode of Brown Bags and Bibles and Books. Yes. Because we are doing, uh, is this week three or four of The Gathering Storm? Yes. Yes. It's week three <laughs> or four of The Gathering Storm by Dr. Al Mohler. And uh, I am joined, as I always, by Mark Liebert. I'm one of the elders at First Christian Church, and I am Scott's faithful wingman, as I clarified you did. last time we did this. You specified I that did. is what you I are I specified now. and clarified. I don't think I specified nor clarified who I am well, today. I think I'm Scott, Scott Wakefield. Lead, did I? I don't know what your role is. What do you do here? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I'm Scott Wakefield, lead pastor here at First Christian Church of Greene County, Tennessee, and yes. we are in week three or four-ish of uh, The Gathering Storm, Al Mohler, mm-hmm. and we've been talking about secularism as the predominant uh, godless ideological worldview that basically drives um, the larger world in yes. which we live. Yeah. Um, We've talked about the gathering storm over Western civilization, and we talked about secularism as an active and passive kind of thing. Um, Passive being, it's just in the air we breathe and we are seduced by, tempted by uh, that culturally, and then active in the sense that some persecution happens because of that right? in some uh, form or fashion. Talked about the gathering storm in the church, and then we talked about the gathering storm over human life, mm-hmm. um, which, by the way, all y'all out there, that is the next thing we'll be doing for the next uh, couple few weeks after gathering storm is, um, how did we say we're going to... St- going to frame that. Uh, well, uh, definitely sanctity of human yes, life. sanctity. I, <laughs> I knew there was an S That's word. the word we were looking for. Sanctity over hum, uh, of human life uh, yeah. we're going to talk about for a few weeks here next. Yeah. Um, so a lot of tentacles to that. To that. Yes, we there are. We want to flesh that out well. But mm-hmm. that's after the book. That is after the book. Um, we talked last week about that uh, secularization, secularization, uh, secu- <laughs> <laughs> this is going well. This is good. <laughs> Keep going, Scott. The secularizing uh, force, the secularization um, uh, when it comes to marriage. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, that parental rights are degrading and eroding in our culture, in our country. Right. Um, and then the family, and then today, gender and sexuality. Right, right. Which, of course, pieces of that have come up. Yes. In the prior discussions mm-hmm. and chapters we've had. It's not like you can separate these and never shall they meet. But today, chapter six particularly, we'll dive into this in detail. Yeah. So the issue here um, over gender and sexuality is, um, as Moeller frames it, revelation, meaning from God, what is the truth about the constituent nature of humanity and sexuality mm-hmm. and gender? Revelation versus revolution, uh, the cultural revolution uh, about sexuality. Yeah, I thought that was helpful. Revelation versus revolution. It's just an easy way to think about it. Are we basing our authority on what God has said in his revealed scriptures? We call that the Bible, which has stood the test of time for thousands of years. Is that our authority? That's revelation from God. Or is Uh it the revolution, which is basically the forces of culture that are changing over time and constantly changing? Yes. uh, Specifically in the sexual sexual revolution and everything involved in that. So mm-hmm. is it revelation that's our authority? Yes. Or is it culture, the revolution, that's our authority? Because right. again, Moeller does a good job framing the book this way from the beginning, and it's yes, important that we bring it out. The issue is one of authority. Yes. What is your authority? Because because you could have an opinion, I can have, have an opinion, and who cares? Right. It's just our opinion. Right. But if we are in fact speaking with authority from someone else, then it carries weight. Yeah. In our case, we would say that authority is found in the written and revealed word of God. That's our authority. But everyone has one. Yes, exactly. Everyone has one. Right. That's what I was about to say. And as we've said many times, whether people are cognizant of it or not, there is an authority from which they are speaking. Right. I think that's yeah. an important thing to bring up because you may be shot down, ridiculed, maligned for <clears throat> believing in this antiquated book as your authority. Yes. <laughs> but the question then is, well, then you who disagree with me, what is your authority? Right. F- name it. What is it? Yeah. That's important because people may not realize it. They may just think, well, I believe in truth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, how do you f- define truth? Right. And why are you defining it that way? You well, have an authority. And he says on page 87, um, the sexual revolution um, usurps the very source and ground of human identity right down to whether or not our creation determines in any sense who we are as humanity. Hmm. So the foundational stuff is, is what's eroded because of uh, the authority being either the revolution 
part that we'll talk about here now Mm -hmm. um, or the revelation. Right. So he summed up this chapter by saying, rather than accepting God's design for gender, marriage, sexuality, all of that, the sexual revolution creates their own categories and forms of expression. I don't think anyone who is alive today can deny that. We see that clearly. Yes. And so, just about everybody would acknowledge yeah, everybody sees that's that. what's going on. That is the world in which we swim. And where it comes from, though, I think is a bit surprising to people uh, because yes. it sounds silly at first to say this yes. like, oh, you uh, I agree. Luddite cavemen uh, <laughs> who know nothing. Um, he says the current sexual revolution, LGBTQ plus agenda right. was made possible by contraception mm-hmm. and abortion on demand. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, I had not thought this through carefully before I read it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was aware of it. Yeah, but I couldn't have articulated it like he not did. Not like he did. Yeah. Yes. He, go, he goes back to the sexual revolution beginning. And this is some background we'll do as yeah. much or as little as you think no, that's, is important. That's great. It's, it is important. But it begins with the advent of birth control in the 1960s. Mm-hmm. Because before birth control, think about this, mm-hmm. sex led to procreation it, to children. It was a built-in <laughs> assumption it that just you happened. have to think about this because this is what's going to happen. Right. The bonds of human relationship and the family obligations that go with it yeah. limited sexual expression yeah. because when you had sex, you had babies. <laughs> <laughs> and that also, by the way, underscored the idea of there is there are two genders, male and female. All of that was built into the fact that contraception was not yet a widespread practice. Sex led to babies. That connected the family. It underscored there's male and female. It it required responsibilities from mother and father. Mm -hmm. All of that began to be eroded with widespread availability of contraceptives. Yeah. Which Uh, we're not saying are wrong in and of themselves. Right. No, this is just an explanatory point here. Right. Um, He says... When the solemnity and sacredness of sex, um, and that's in addition to the things you've said about sex inevitably leading to procreation, mm-hmm. um, when when that became the case for us in modern culture, the lifelong covenant of marriage was downgraded to the temporary contract yeah. of marriage, um, and so you didn't have to uh, <laughs> you didn't have to worry about procreation, right? Because we can just have Sex. Right. It, it, he says contraception severs the relationship between sex and children. Yeah. And was, responsibility. Yes. Right. It separates pregnancy and procreation. Children are now avoidable right. in sex, which means, and this is what we've seen, now you can have sexual expression outside of marriage Absolutely. because it doesn't lead to the consequence of children. Right. And that ultimately leads to reimagining sexuality and gender because no longer is there a relationship between sex leads to children. Yes. It's, it's amazing how radical be fruitful and multiply in Genesis ends yeah. up being in our modern culture when it comes yeah. to this issue of sex. Yeah. Uh, I noted one thing he said where humanity was now, because of this, liberated from the oppressive chains of a biblical worldview and morality. In other words, because now you could separate them, Western civilization eliminated, jettisoned the sacred, precious, intimate expression of love in favor of a sexual revolution with no restraint. That led to divorce. And then soon thereafter comes abortion in 1973. Yes. So divorce rates skyrocket. Yep. Um, Childless marriages. Increase. um, Increase. Um, Sex outside of marriage now has limited to no consequences. Right. Um, and, um, and so what ends up ultimately happening is uh, the production of human life in, in proactive, good, procreative kind of Which terms, we talked about last week. Um, is sacrificed on this altar of personal expression, yeah. of sexual liberation. That's uh, right. It just doesn't even, it doesn't even have to occur as a factor for, for folks who want to express it's all about that individual expression yes it is it's interesting so contraception severs the relationship between sex and children Mm -hmm. and now abortion being legalized Mm -hmm. separates the relationship between pregnancy and children right like they don't one doesn't lead to the other anymore right it doesn't have to given the legalization of abortion so now you can you can prevent pregnancy through contraception but now unwanted children can easily be eliminated yes which means my responsibility <laughs> to uh, produce something beyond my life in the here and now, um, meaning in those around me who become my children, who become the future um, 
sociocultural fabric that holds up a society. Yeah. Um, needn't be something I have a sense of responsibility for. Right. Like, I think that's a big deal. The implications of this are far beyond the yeah. uh, what what can I enjoy for myself sexually in the here and now. Yeah, I think, you know, some women may hear us speak and think, but you are holding back the progress that has allowed women to be able to flourish and do things and not be saddled down with children. But I want to point out one thing. For fathers, this has been Horrific, because now you have removed the responsibility from the man Absolutely. of bringing a child into the world. Like yes. there was a way, a sense in which the family unit was held together and men were responsible mm -hmm. because sex led to, to pregnancy, pregnancy led to children, children led to responsibility and obligation. Mm -hmm. And now that chain is completely broken. Absolutely. So it doesn't just hurt women, it hurts women because men no longer act the way they ought to act. Yeah, fatherlessness is one of the um, unintended consequences. Yeah. so in Inevitably so. Yeah, so what we're saying is the sanctity of human life, which we'll talk about in our next series, yep. was sacrificed, this is basically his quote, on the altar of sexual liberation. Yes, and progress. Oh, progress, human progress. Progress. Yes. Right, and one of these leads to the next. Like what we've been saying here is a chain of, well, you do this, now this is the next consequence. Yes. And the next consequence after all this freedom of sexual liberation and expression is LGBT, uh, yes, gay rights. Yes, that's the inevitable next step. That's where that comes from. Like if we wonder, how did we get to this place in our society yes. today, looking back 200 years, like what got us here? Uh -huh. We're explaining what got us here. It started in the 60s with contraception and everyone led to this freedom and this progress of liberation. Yeah. And that began in the late 60s. Yeah, the gay rights movement, yeah. Stonewall Inn, New York City, Greenwich Village. Yeah. Um, Before the late 60s, people may not even realize same-sex relations was a crime in 49 states. Mm -hmm. And I am not advocating it should go back to being a crime. Uh, that, that's for another discussion. I think it comes down to the fact that you are responsible for God for your actions. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, just giving the history, it was a crime in 49 states. And in fact, homosexuality was classified then as a mental illness. In the DSM-3, I believe, at the yeah. time. Maybe. Just interesting where we came from. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but that all began to change in the late 60s with the gay rights movement, gay pride parades. First one was in New York City. Others soon followed after that. Uh, the, which, you, which on the face was about equality, um, but, but I think was much more about a functional suppression of differing, divergent worldviews, concepts. Um, and so, so we're to the point now where a, a Christian worldview that says um, that same-sex marriage is not good for the flourishing of our culture right. is, um, is something that needs to be classified as hate crime. Yeah. This is important because you think, well, we just reached a place where we're all tolerant then. No, it's not, it's not so simple. Right. Because the agenda of the LGBTQ plus revolution is not looking for equality. It is looking, as you said, for the suppression of other worldviews that disagree with them. Right. And so a Christian worldview is called an autocratic repressive view that threatens progress, <laughs> to quote Moeller. Autocratic repressive view that threatens progress. Progress right. of what? Right. Human freedom. Human individual autonomy and self-expression. Right, right. So the only acceptable outcome from the agenda of those who push LGBTQ plus is unconditional surrender to their worldview. That's it. That's success. Yeah. It is not equality. No, and, and I dominance. would say, and I would say, the inevitable result of um, an individual autonomy that is about self-expression is a place where um, the idea of a Christian worldview as autocratic will look soon enough minor, yeah, compared to what what I can do as a part of my self-expression right. that goes far beyond the things we're even talking about right here. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the reasons he gives to explain how we know this, that the, the ultimate goal is not tolerance, but it is dominance of mm -hmm. this worldview, is the fact that in 2015, when 
the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage. Obergefell. Right. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. We haven't yet seen from there that point on a huge number of same-sex marriages. Mm. Like we've seen some. Mm -hmm. But not this, like the dam was holding back the water and it broke and now there's tons of same-sex marriages. Right. And his point is because marriage was never the goal. That's why we haven't seen it. What was desired is total sexual freedom and anarchy where anything goes. Marriage is still oppressive yes. in this worldview yes. because it ties you down still to two people. Yes. That's, that's the point Moeller makes where you see now the agenda at work. It couldn't just be marriage because we don't see that being the case. Yeah. Um, the next day um, after a burger fell, um, lawsuits began to be pushed for man boy love yeah. um normalization yeah and we're certainly not saying that that's true for everyone but that's what we're seeing that's the it constantly pushes the envelope because it's never enough yeah. until it is total sexual freedom there is always going to be an argument from this societal push to do away with it this is why it was so important as we were talking earlier about uh biblical views of politics, why it was so important to establish that the proper governmental role, according to the Bible, is to restrain evil so that there are constraints on human depravity. Um, and that's of all sides uh, politically. Um, that's super important. Mm -hmm. um, but that's no con no constraints is the goal. Yeah, that's here. the goal. Yeah, um, because, because if that's not the goal, then tell me what the constraints are. Right, right. That, that's not... That's not part of the political machinations. It's not part of the uh, narrative. Mm -hmm. It's not part of the. Um, this is this is what this act is meant to do. Right. Um, and here are the limits of it. Yeah, I, I think it's important at this point to point out there is legislation called Fairness for All. We did talk about this last year at one point. Mm -hmm. Fairness for All is an attempt of people to draw these two polar sides together, a Christian worldview and mm -hmm. those who advocate for LGBTQ, mm -hmm. to find a compromise where we can all agree to respect each other's position. Sure. The problem is the LGBTQ agenda is, it believes that marriage is merely a union of consenting adults. So it's regardless of biology. It, yes. One can be male, female, neither, both. As a social construct. Right, right, right. And so the LGBTQ agenda wants to punish, it wants laws that punish dissent from that view <laughs> or anyone that treats, <laughs> or in fact, it wants to treat as irrational people like me and you who believe that men and women biology. are biologically rooted yes. and made for each other in marriage. It wants to treat that as irrational yes. and have laws that punish dissent against that. Yeah. That's the ultimate goal. So yes, fairness for all sounds like a great idea. Can't we all just get along, right? right? But at the end of the day, if the person you're working with will only accept the outcome of dominance, it's really hard to get along and say, here's a middle ground because you want dominance. Yeah. So the goal of um, this sexual revolution is to be like God. It is. Why do you say that? Because um, then our bodies as, as self-expression um, are my acts of creation. Mm. Um, so that individual autonomy that drives the sexual revolution um, is a way for me to author myself yeah. in the world um, without without a foundational um, authority beyond myself. Yeah, it's an absorption with the self. Yeah. All of this is an absorption with self, as if the world and the universe revolves around me. And, and, and the irony is, um, and he says this in this quote that I'll mention here in just a second, the irony of giving yourself to the self is that that's actually driven by authorities outside of the self. Hmm. Um, that's in the cultural secularizing stuff we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, this didn't come out of nowhere. Right. Um, in fact, we could we could talk a little bit about, um, I think he refers to the book called uh, After the Ball, mm -hmm. um, the yes. methods that the sexual rights, uh, especially the gay rights um, agenda uh, used to get to the point to where we are now mm -hmm. uh, means that those who talk about authoring self without um, 
without an authority have actually done that based on such an authority hmm. without acknowledging. I follow you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he says, in the pursuit of individual liberty, the outcome is continued bondage to whatever might be the prevailing cultural ethic. Yeah, that's right. So it's, it's constantly changing. That it's, that it's an always changing authority. And people... Who, who were on the side of pushing this progressive view have found themselves suddenly behind the curve and being persecuted by others who are further along in the radicalization. Yeah, those who were third wave radical feminists now are saying, what has happened? Right, a great example. So this I'm is being the, canceled. This is the T many of them. in yeah. LGBTQ. It's, right. it's the trans movement. It's, it's redefining humanity itself. This is far more than sexual preference. This is redefining humanity. And those who were radical before <laughs> have gotten in trouble Right. Because they're not radical enough. And he gives a couple examples. One being, and I grew up watching her play tennis. She was fantastic. Martina Navratilova. Sure. Uh, her, her and Chrissy, ever when they were playing each other, I loved watching that. Mm -hmm. Well, she has been a, a champion of lesbian rights for a long, long time. But she got in trouble because she came out against this trans movement and said, yeah. you can't proclaim, quote, you can't just proclaim yourself a female and be able to compete against women, unquote. And we would say, you're right. And she, uh, he points out, you can do hormone treatments, you can call it what it is, you can identify as you want, but biological males still possess bone density, muscle mass, skeletal structure, and a circulatory system that is different between men and women. And yep. that gives them an advantage if they're competing head-to-head -head yes. in athletic competitions. And so she's right. Yep. Th this woman who was a, a champion mm -hmm. that I love to watch basically now is on the wrong side of culture. Wrong side of history. Wrong side of history. It's exactly right yes um, despite all of the hormone treatments the biological males still possess the benefits as you said of those things even after all of that yeah yeah so he says what began as a gay rights movement has morphed into a wide-ranging attempt to redefine male and female marriage and now even pronouns right right uh, because as you pointed out individual autonomy is the ultimate source of meaning yes that's a worldview it is a worldview Individual autonomy, self-rule, uh -huh. self-expression yes. is the ultimate source of meaning. That's the authority and the perspective all this is coming from. It's why now the pronouns are neutroy and demiboy and demigirl and pangender and genderqueer. It's confusing, contradictory. It's nonsensical. It is nonsensical. And the House is considering legislation now to do away with mother, father, son, daughter, um, kind of language in keeping with this kind of uh, yeah. nonsense. It is the natural progression stuff. of where this goes when you jettison an authority that defines structure in a way that gives you a foundation to build upon. And one of the points is there's not a foundation to build upon. No. There's not a societal foundation. No. And, and you will see politicians, and you pointed this out, uh, athletes, um, comedians, those in Hollywood, all working hard to not be on the wrong side of history, right. to not say the wrong thing. And they may say something two years ago that was perfectly fine, but that's now brought up from their Twitter feed or whatever, and they have to backtrack from that because this ball is rolling downhill so quickly yeah. that you can't possibly stay ahead of the curve. And as we will talk about with the gathering storm of the engines of culture, that's why there's constantly a virtue signaling mm. that has to be. What's virtue signaling, Scott? Uh, virtue signaling is signaling one's virtue. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's putting out there, this is where I am. Um, so don't a, come after me. As a posture that yeah. says, I'm, I'm cool with right. all that stuff. Yeah. I'm not a Luddite weirdo Mark Liebert Scott Wakefield. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it's putting out there something to pacify everyone. Hey, I, I believe like you do, whether yes. you do or not. It's just to keep people off your back. Yeah. What else do we want to say about um, this? Well, let's go to the church now. Okay. Because it's one thing to say this is what our culture does. Yes. What else we would expect our culture to do? It's what they will do. But we as a church have a responsibility. And we can proclaim the truth and for those who will hear, but we also need to help those inside the church understand yes. our authority is different. So th th there is a demand that this revolution is placing on the church. And because, as we said before, it demands total surrender yeah. and complete dominance. But we see this in the church, and that's what we need to be guarded against. I, I, I had read about this 2018 Revoice mm -hmm. conference. Yeah. That was interesting. It was, if people are not familiar with it, it was an attempt to support, encourage, empower, listen carefully, gay, lesbian, and same-sex attracted or other LGBT Christians yes. who are celibate. Yes. 
but identify as such so they can flourish while still protecting Christian marriage and sexuality. Now, what's wrong with that? Um, the identity is not something that says Christian only. There's yeah. a moniker in addition to that that's more definitional than yeah. admitted. Yeah. I think, that's, I think that's what I see as one of the main, main issues there. Um, not only that, but of course, as we've said, you do not you do not build a societal framework for the flourishing of humanity um, while saying, um, and it's one thing to have a biblical definition of celibacy by itself. Mm -hmm. um, but if we continue to, to, to open that to um, the sexual self-expression where more can be defined by that, um, that detracts from be fruitful and multiply. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He pointed out some things I thought were very helpful. He says, the problem with identifying yourself as a Christian, as a celibate Christian, mm -hmm. as LGBT, whatever, gay, the problem is now you have taken on as identity a sexual minority view that implies permanency, identity, recognition. Created as such. Mm -hmm. And it is ultimately taking on for yourself an identity which is of something where in its essence, it's a rejection of God's design and command. Right. Your identity has now become at odds with God's design and command. Yeah. You can't possibly take that as an identity because it is at odds with God's design and command. It which is where identity. we see um, in Scripture Jesus saying uh, to the Pharisees, <laughs> how do you not know? Have you not heard? Have you not God? read? And of course... They had read. Yes. They had heard. Yes. And that was the point of him saying, have you not read? Um, that God created the male and female. Yeah. To, to be a Christian, even a celibate one, and say you are LGBTQ, whatever, mm -hmm. is to claim an identity with a pattern of sexual attraction that is sinful, according yes. to God. Yes. And you're defining that attraction that the Bible defines as sinful, as acceptable in that sense. Right. So while I applaud the celibacy. Sure. I applaud the attempt of the conference to protect biblical sexuality and marriage. I do not agree with taking on or assuming an identity that by itself is at odds with God's command and design. That even, cannot be your identity. Even if it's not externally lived, right. Right. but it's only internally held. Right. Uh, internal desires um, are not um, are, are not. Um, uh, suddenly not counted as sinful. Yeah, yeah. That, that's an important thing that I had not thought through as carefully uh, until I read what he explained. This, this idea of internal desires. Like, like sometimes you will hear people say, well, it's okay because I was born that way or that's a natural part of who I am or I am being true to myself. All that terminology talks about what I naturally feel and desire and want as if the determiner of what is right and wrong is how I am Feeling. How I lean, <laughs> how I feel, how I desire, how I desire things. Um, so I, I, th I thought it'd be helpful if we just cover a couple verses where clearly scripture says what comes out of your heart is not the determining factor of what is good. In fact, it's the opposite. Mark 7, uh, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. This is Jesus. For from within, out of the heart of man. Come evil thoughts, sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, yada, yada, yada. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. It's interesting. It, he calls it evil thoughts, evil things. He says it comes from within, from the heart, and it defiles you. Mm -hmm. So the old adage, look within yourself. The truth is within yourself. <laughs> That's not what Jesus said. He no. said, if you look within yourself, you will find nothing but defilement. Yes, that's, that's a form of perspectivalism, the standpoint epistemology. It's my autonomy that defines those things. Um, that, according to the scriptures, is um, what defiles and what condemns. Yeah. Yeah. James 1, 13 through 15, he said, let's be clear on this. Don't say God's tempting you. God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So where does it come from? Verse 14, each one is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? It comes from within. The mm -hmm. evil comes from within, not from God. Mm -hmm. Romans 1, 26 and 7, um, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Uh, 
for the reason that their inward disposition um, is to uh, is to push down who God is and what he what he has said about us. Mm -hmm. Um, For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, women exchanging natural relations for those contrary to nature, which is a phrase Paul uses there. It's a paraphysis. It's contrary to nature, which is that Hebrew conception of the way God created things is the natural thing. Mm -hmm. And so this is opposite of of God's natural creation. Um, So he's choosing that to say this, uh, this inward even and external, but this desire mm-hmm. for this unnatural, yes, unnatural relations is not how God made it. Right. Uh, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. The men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, committing shameful acts with men, receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. He calls it error. He calls it dishonorable. He calls it contrary to nature. He calls it shameless. Mm-hmm. And it all originates from within where Jesus said, the evil comes that defiles us. Yeah. But 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 is probably the, the capstone on this. Paul writing to the Corinthians, do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. And then he lists neither the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Were. Were. Yeah. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Four words there at the end in that uh, last uh, that last verse. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so this this is an interesting point that he makes, and I, I think we should spend just a little bit of time on this. This idea of what about same sex attraction by itself? Hmm. So let, let's go back to that. God created Eve for Adam. Yes, she was custom made to meet his needs sexually, mm-hmm. and thereby he establishes a pattern in creation that human sexual expression is one man, one woman. Mm-hmm. It's normal. It's natural. Males should be attracted to females. Females should be attracted to males. Mm-hmm. From man. Right. Yeah. So we can say from that, some heterosexual acts are sinful. They are, sure. including any sexual activity outside of marriage. Absolutely. But all homosexual acts are sinful according to scripture. We listed a few. You go to Leviticus 18, Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6. That's why Paul uses contra nature paraphysis. Right. So this is important. Scripture does not morally equate a committed homosexual relationship within marriage with a committed homosexual. I'm sorry, let me say it differently. It does not equate a committed heterosexual marriage with a committed homosexual marriage, regardless of whether it's same sex marriage or not. It's not the same thing. Right. It's not the same thing. And then I was uh, just reading another author on this. I thought this was a helpful explanation. Any desire for something God has forbidden is the result of sin. Sin has so infected our natures, and I'm, this is now coming from Got Questions, if you want to look that up. It's very helpful. Sin has so infected our natures that what is evil often looks good. We are infected with sin. Mm-hmm. It causes us to have warped thoughts, warped desires, warped proclivities, inclinations. We are sinners by nature. So to sum it up, heterosexual attraction is not sin, but heterosexual lust is, right? Jesus said that very clearly. John Matthew 5, right? He equates lust with the sin of adultery. Mm-hmm. But homosexuality, the point Mueller makes, yeah, I agree, homosexuality is different because homosexual behavior in any context is an action that the Bible or God forbids. Right. Therefore, it's sinful by itself to desire to commit homosexual acts. Now, now this is careful, and I, I want to get you to play off this to make sure I say this correctly. So let me say it again. It is sinful to even desire to commit homosexual acts. The feelings of same-sex attraction, though, those feelings are not the same thing as willful active sin. They're still rooted in the fallen nature. So it's an expression of the sin nature to have same-sex attraction. John Piper puts it this way. Here's the distinction. Same-sex desires are sinful in the sense that they're disordered by sin and exist contrary to God's revealed will. Sure. But to be caused by sin, those desires, and rooted in sin, those desires, does not make a sinful desire equal to sinning. Sinning is what happens when rebellion against God expresses itself through our disorders. So here's the point Mueller makes. I think he's right. I just want to get you to play off it. Heterosexual attraction in and of itself is not wrong. 
it can become lustful mm -hmm. when it is wrong, sure. and any expression outside of marriage is definitely wrong. Mm -hmm. Homosexual attraction in and of itself is still sinful sure. because it is existing in contrary to God's revealed creation and design. Yes. But it is not at the same level of active willful sin whereby you then act it out, either by lusting in the mind, right. which is always a sin, right. or by acting it out physically. So right. it is sinful in that it's rooted in sin and exists contrary to God's revealed will. Yes. But it is not the same as the act of sin, which is when our sinful expression is acted out through our flesh. That's the point Moeller makes. I think he's right. Your thoughts? When the attraction turns into lust. Yes. Then you have gone from a sinful desire to the act of sinning. See, he, he, that's the difference he makes. Even having the desire right. is disordered. It, right. It's disordered by sin. Yes. So it is sinful mm -hmm. in that sense. Uh, he, he, put, he puts it that, well, the, the one theologian says, at some level, same-sex attraction is always an expression of the sin nature. Sure. Yes. But we are not saying that temptation and sin are, are the, equivalent. Right, are the same thing. And I think that's important. Yeah. Um, because to act it out, even in a lustful way, yes. is the act of sinning and is therefore much worse. All right, I'll stop. I know I said a mouthful, and I know that's a lot to think about. Yes, and we're being we're into fine distinctions. Right. At what point does it change from a same-sex attraction right. into an act, a willful act of sin? At what point in the mind does that happen? I can't tell you that. I'm not God. Right. Um, to lust is wrong. Yes. Obviously, for heterosexual and homosexual. In any form, lust is wrong. Yes. Easy. Um, the distinction is not even so much about the act of the lusting, but the distinction is between uh, the disordered um, desire. Yeah. Even. Like where does that desire come from for something that is contrary to God's will? Yeah. It does not come from God. It comes from a sin nature that is so corrupt and warped that we want that which displeases God. Yeah. So same-sex attraction is at some level – an expression of the sin nature. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I don't want anyone to misread us, mishear us, and think it's the same thing as active willful sin. You may be a Christian who struggles with same-sex attraction. Right. What we are saying is that in and of itself is just an evidence that you're a sinner. Yes. In the same way that in, I struggle with many, many things. In the same way that anyone must struggle against um expression in active sense beyond um, a disordered desire. Yeah. In, in the sense that all of us struggle with the flesh, mm -hmm. the old nature, the yeah. old man, whatever version you use. We are not saying it rises to the same level, though it is sinful in that category, yeah. of active willful sin. Because that is where, by the power of the Spirit of God, you can resist temptation because... And, and, and I'd like to, I think it's important that we point out like 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation is overtaking you except as is common to man. Yeah. And God is faithful. He will, with the temptation, provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Right. Which is the case for those who have that disordered same-sex attractive desire. Right. right. It's the case. It's possible for them. Um, yeah. It, this is complex stuff. And uh, the one theologian I was reading said, there's no way for us to be able to identify and delineate exactly at which point it goes from just a disordered desire. Right. And that's what I was trying to sort of get at there. And I'm yeah. not sure that's doable. Yeah. No. And, and, and the, <laughs> the theologian I said, read said, we can't do that. I, I can't tell you at what point it just goes from a disordered desire rooted in the sinful nature right. into an act of willful sin somewhere in the mind. But wherever it does go from disordered desire to something that's active as a result of that desire, that's sin. Yes, that's active willful sin. We can at least say that's clear. Right. So I guess a way for me to say it for me is I am attracted to females. Sure. That is my natural inclination. Uh -huh. If I allow myself to think, look, yes. in any way, linger with my eyes, whatever it is, mm -hmm. on someone other than my wife, mm -hmm. I have crossed a line. Mm -hmm. And now it is active willful sin, even if it's just in my mind briefly. And your awareness of that. I am very aware of that. And, and keen, um, our, our awareness of that 
is no different yeah. than the same-sex attraction issue. Right. Right. The, the only difference we're saying here is it is the result of the chaos of sin in this world mm -hmm. that has led you mm -hmm. to struggle with same-sex attraction. Mm -hmm. It is not something you asked for. It is not something that comes from outside, although there are influences. Mm -hmm. It is the sin nature within us that is so disordered things that we no longer desire what God says in the beginning is good. Yeah. So Christian answer here for uh, this chapter about gender and sexuality is we have to say God's design and creation is true and it's good. Yeah. So he made a male and female. He blessed them. In fact, he says it's very good very when he good. makes male and female. Yes. And Everything he, else is good. Yeah. This is very good. And I love the fact that he brings the woman to the man. Mm. Like that's a huge statement on God's design and what he wants. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have to say that Jesus confirmed God's design for marriage uh, by in Matthew 19, reclaiming God's true and good design for the world and for man and woman. Yeah. Uh, Matthew 19, he says about Genesis 2, 24, don't, don't you know they made them, God made the male and female, um, f be fruitful and multiply, yeah. do the good thing that I've been doing in your marriage relationship. Jesus himself confirmed that. That's a point that a lot of people, I think, uh, uh, bypass. Yeah. Uh, but that's definite. He's saying that because it's definitional. Yeah. Uh, we must understand that when we reject the created order that God put in place, the right word for what happens as a result of that is condemnation and judgment. It is. Um, judgment is the thing that happens yeah, when we what, reject God's created order. That's what we see when Adam and Eve rebelled. There was judgment. There was condemnation. There was sin entered the world. Mm -hmm. But we don't just see it there. We see that everywhere where we reject God's design and order. Yeah. Uh, we have to recognize that our identity can only be established by God. Yeah. I think that's huge. If you're you a Christian. And I do not get to just make up our identity. Yeah. If you are a Christian, regardless of what you struggle with, like, for example, if I struggle with alcohol, mm -hmm. I don't define myself as I am Mark Liebert, an alcoholic. I define myself as I am Mark Liebert, a child of the risen king, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ yes. and forever his child. That's who I am. Yes. Oh, and by the way, I may until I am taken to glory, uh -huh. I will continue to struggle with a few things along the way. That's and right. one of those may be a proclivity toward alcoholism. Yes. But you didn't start with that because that's, that's not, not who, who I you am. are. It's not who I am. Yes. That's why we call God Father. Yeah. Um, we need to believe that the gospel is the power of God. Yeah. Paul says the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. And not the power, power. of man. Right. Not ours. Right. Power of God. Yeah. Um, we hold to the scripture, not merely because it's true, but because it points to the truth that produces real and lasting human happiness. Yeah. For those who would say you just want to push your religion down right. people's throats. Yes. I would say, first of all, it's not our religion. It is God's design and he's the maker. He calls the shots, not us. Right. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is if he calls the shots and he is a God who created things for good, mm -hmm. then to do things his way brings the most good. It's about human flourishing for all. Yeah. Um, that, that we say God's purposes and designs are best. Yeah. Um, we have to treat, uh, we have to preach true gospel liberty. Yeah. So this goes back to what you were saying earlier, Scott, that the sexual revolution promises it offers, yes. it says freedom from the bondage of Christian shackles. Yeah. But the reality is that freedom is found <laughs> only in Christ and brings only more bondage. Yes. Sin leads to further slavery. Yeah. Yeah. Galatians five, one for freedom. Christ has set us free. Stand firm. Therefore, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. What slavery? Sin. Yeah. Um, and this last point, I think, is, is lost on a lot of people. And he makes this point clear. Um, and I think it's important to say yeah. we have to be the ones who are ready to receive the refugees of the sexual revolution. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, I know we've been harsh up to this point. At least it sounds like it's so black and white. Say that again, Scott. We as believers, we as the church, we as Christians have to be ready to receive the refugees of the sexual revolution. Yeah, the, the sexual revolution makes promises it cannot keep. Right. It will not bring human flourishing. Absolutely. It not. will not bring happiness. It, can't. it will not bring fulfillment, and it will not bring ultimate identity. That's right. It can't. 
And many people, and especially our young people, our adolescents, as the age drops every year, yeah. they will reap the whirlwind of consequence of this, and our heart must be one of compassion for them. Yeah, this is going to continue to be an emerging, um, I was going to say issue, that's not quite the right way to say it, but emerging um, thing for us to have to, to deal with is there will continue to be more and more who are damaged by, um, and we've already seen some of this. Mm -hmm. um, the church has been long active in um, crisis pregnancy centers yeah. and helping those who have been through abortion yeah. and uh, those who are abortion survivors yeah. um, in terms of the moms and others, babies too, and, and foster care and adoption. Yeah. And, and in those kinds of ways yeah. um, that are about pro-life in all of its forms. Right. Um, the church has long been doing that, um, unbeknownst to the world, of course, because they're not all that aware of it. Um, but the next parts of this trajectory that we're going to have to continue to deal with is those who are um, the shrapnel yeah. of That's good. LGBTQIA kinds of things that um, will increasingly over time reject those who have bought into those yeah ways of living and identifying right and the, the more and more our culture tells parents let your child decide what gender they are mm -hmm. go through the hormone treatments the more and more we will see adults regretting decisions that were made by absolutely. them or for them in their youth absolutely and it's not helpful yeah. for us to just say ha ha see no it's not helpful we were at all. telling you all along. That's right. no different than anyone else that we deal with who is who is uh, uh, recovering from sin yeah. and yeah. their own sin, their own enslavement to that sin. Yeah. P please understand, we have a program called Regeneration here, and Scott and I have been through it, and multiple times we have said from the stage, my name is Mark, I have a new life in Christ mm -hmm. identity, yeah. and I'm recovering from a struggle with, and we will name the ways in which we have failed the Lord, mm -hmm. and in which we are saddled with a sinful flesh that makes it challenging in this life. Mm -hmm. We are well aware sure. of our own sin yeah. and the struggles that we have. So we must be a church that's about grace, love, and compassion, yeah. because every one of us is in desperate need of a redeeming Savior. Every one of us. And that self-awareness, that, that awareness of the struggle against sin is what actually positions us best Yeah, um, to help those who are refugees from the sexual revolution. Yeah, I, I think we end with this, like you said, Scott, because it's critical that you understand. Scott is lead pastor, I as an elder. You come to us wanting help, we will help. Yep. We will not condemn because we are, we would have been the first to have stones thrown against us. Yeah. And yet we received mercy. So we will extend grace and mercy to everyone who comes asking for it. Yes. And all the while aware asking for that help is different than an agenda to do something through us. It is very true. Um, okay, we've got questions, and we don't have much time. So sure. let's get to some questions. How is advocating for a Christian and biblical worldview different than the LGBTQ advocating for theirs? Mm -hmm. How is advocating for the Christian worldview different than the LGBT ad advocating for theirs? Um, if at one level to you, you want to say, in philosophical terms, is there any difference uh, between Rational argumentation for this and rational argumentation for that? Uh, of course not. Right. Um, Those terms, sure. So in advocacy terms, in a one-on-one -on -one for one relationship, there's no difference. Um, do they believe theirs is true? Maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, make that argument. Make the argument for why an LGBTQ sexual revolutionary worldview is true about what the world says, what the world is, how that will help society. Um, I don't think that's the actual argumentation used. Um, so I'd say there's a bit of a difference there um, because one is uh, ours is this is a claim about all of reality. Yeah, this is a claim about objective truth. Yes, which is a bit different than saying political advocacy that has these kinds of uh, tentacles to it, but it doesn't go beyond that. Yeah. Tell me how LGBTQ um, thinking about the world is about human flourishing, period. Yeah. Um, so if we use the, the same kinds of measures for how we're making the decisions about those worldview claims, 
Okay. Yeah, I, I would say if, if this argument resonates, great. If not, I, you know, only God can change a heart. But you receive, <laughs> you receive a gift at Christmas, and it's a complicated gift. You want to know how it works. You've never used it before. You read the instruction manual so that you use it in the way it was designed, and therefore it works properly. Yeah. What we're saying is a Christian worldview is the instruction manual for how to operate this thing called humanity. And it actually works. And it works because it comes from the designer. In fact, we have the receipts for how it works. Right. So if I take this complicated thing that I received at Christmas and I use it as a hammer mm-hmm. to hit other things. Yeah. I may be able to knock some things down, but I will not use it for what it was tended and I'll just destroy it in the process. Yeah. So our argument is we're linking up the machine with the instruction manual and that is good for everyone. That's the key difference. Yeah. The next part of that question says, couldn't they say that we want to impose ours upon them just as we are saying they want to impose theirs upon us? Yes, but also no. So I said in the beginning, I don't want to go back to where homosexuality was a crime punishable by whatever it was in the old uh, 50 years ago. Right. Because ultimately, if that's a decision they make, they will stand before God to be held accountable in the same way that I will for my life. Mm -hmm. But that's not the same thing as saying, but here's right and here's wrong and here's why. So it is not the same thing because the agenda of those who are pushing LGBTQ want to punish Fine, you name it, those who would promote a different worldview. Yeah. We are not looking to do that here. That is not what we're trying to do. We're saying, here's the blueprint, follow the instruction manual. It's for human flourishing. And I would make one further point. Our biggest responsibility is to the church. It is to the church. Yeah. The world will do what the world does. Yes. Our responsibility as shepherds is to help our flock stay away from the cliff and be a witness to the world in a winsome way around them. Yes, which we, is for human flourishing about yes. the community in the world. Yeah. yeah. So I would make all those distinctions. It's sure. not quite the same. Yeah. Um, as a Christian who believes in objective truth, uh, truth doesn't change, exists outside my understanding, my perspective, my feelings about it. As a Christian who believes in objective truth, how do I love my LGBT neighbor without enabling their sin? Um the same way you love other people who are um, sinners um, and not enabling their sin. Um, you do that now with those who aren't LGBTQ neighbors. Um, so Everybody's dealing with sin. The same way. Do you enable sin with people who are not LGBTQ? I would hope not. Right. <laughs> Everybody's um, dealing with sin. Next part of this question says, especially if their subjective truths are aggressive. Okay. Um, I think we will always, in the current culture, be sort of absorbing aggressively anti-Christian truth. Mm -hmm. That's just normal. Yeah. Uh, For a small example, if they're demanding, I call them a name they weren't originally or a pronoun that I don't believe they actually are biologically. In this specific scenario, names and titles are of little consequence if it allows me to talk about the gospel long term, right? Uh, Essentially, how do we love those who exist in a, quote, reality outside of the biblical reality without enabling that unreality, we'll say. It feels like Christians are currently surrounded by false realities that want to dictate, even through law, what we are allowed to believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are professors who have lost their tenureship because they refuse to refer to a student who was biologically male with female pronouns or vice versa. Um, Obviously, you can use the name. (laughs) People have all sorts of names these days. But I would not encourage behavior Maybe this is the broad way of putting it, Scott. What do you think? I would not encourage behavior that promotes a false reality. I, I was thinking something similar. Um, I, I mean, I'm not looking to pick a fight. No. Um, and and be able to say clearly, hey, this is why. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to stay here. Right. And here's why. Right. Um, and all the other kinds of ways that we can continue to be friends and I can love you and I can right. uh, show you the love of Jesus I'm all about it. I still yeah. want to do that. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it's helpful for you if I give in to saying this is the way the world works and this right. is reality. And here are the reasons why. Right. Um, yeah, I agree with that. I can treat you respectfully and lovingly, 
but I am not going to further encourage a false view of reality that in the end will just harm you. Yes. Um, and I think that this is actually an act of love because of this for these reasons to, to, to it say is. it that way. Bonhoeffer said that uh, in before he died, the pastor in Germany who mm-hmm. was part of plots to take Hitler out, I mean, he, took, he took it seriously. He, he talked about the fact, you can look up his, look up his quote because I'm not going to say it perfectly, but he basically says, to not tell someone what they need to hear yeah. is not a loving thing. No, it's not. It is a, a crime against them. It's a hatred to them to not tell them what they need to hear because you don't want to risk offending them. Right. And people say, well, it's compassion on my part. And he says, no, it's not compassionate. To not tell someone what they need to hear yes. because it's for their good is the opposite of compassion. Exactly. It just feels hard. Yes. It may be hard for us to live that way. Right. That. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that has consequences, mm-hmm. um, as you already said, um, with a professor that may yeah. lose one's job because of that. Yeah. Um, those may be the consequences for us. It's not loving to talk as if the world is different than it is right. for the sake of that person. Um, that doesn't mean you have to be a jerk. No, please don't no be a jerk. No one's saying that. In fact, that's why we're saying we must think through how we say these things and why. Yeah, I I hope we don't come across in any way promoting um, uh, being a jerk, as you said, or coming across arrogant. Uh, What we're arguing for is objective reality because it comports to the design of the creator, and that's how humans flourish. And that's for everyone's good. And humility is rooted in understanding that the authority isn't from me. I'm not the authority here. Yeah. Like I, I've often thought of people say, what do you think about this? And coming back with, it doesn't matter what I think. Yeah. Like what I think is of no consequence whatsoever. However, can I help you point to someone whose view does matter? Right. And that would be the creator almighty God. Yes. And if I get it wrong, call me on it. But here's what the creator said. His view matters. Mine doesn't. And that's helpful. That's helpful for us as communicators of that to make that distinction. Um, because it removes it removes us from being the oracle. Yeah. And I would also say, why do we even have a discussion like today? It would be so much easier for Scott and for me <laughs> to not say these things. It's so much easier for us to just go along with the wave of society and of where culture is headed. That would be so easy. In a sense. You know, in a, in a very large way, our preparation for this, our prayer about this, and our taking the time to speak about this is the most loving thing we can do. Yes. Because it's hard. Yes. Um, next question says, can a Christian and a pro-LGBTQ plus person have a mutual friendship? Yes. Yes. Um... Next question, however, if we're so vocal, such as this book, about the wrongness of their agenda, sure. how do we create a safe place for the refugees of the sexual revolution? I think we've touched on it some. Yeah, I, um, I had a... I, go ahead. Well, I just was going to say, um, I know we already have a safe place for refugees. I agree. In ways that are actually occurring. I agree. um, In ways that aren't well known, aren't largely seen by most, um, won't fit the narrative, um, is not gonna make much in the way of uh, a dent in in the press of people's measurement of how the local church is doing this, comma, but the local church is already automatically in the business of being a safe place for the refugees of those who are not just from the sexual revolution, but anybody and everybody who wants to understand who God is and what Christ means for them uh, yes. that is going on and and we are only responsible as it goes for this local church yeah. where we are elders scott is lead pastor also an elder here but we work so hard at this church yeah. of being a place where if you will come as we have mm-hmm. with a humble repentant heart for your sin mm-hmm. as we have mm-hmm. we will together encourage one another to follow a jesus who redeems everyone who comes to him by faith which is to say the, the way to be the the safest place for refugees of the sexual revolution is to be a safe place for refugees of the evil one and of the world that um, <laughs> condemns and that we are delivered from this present evil age. Being a safe place for refugees of sin is the way. Yeah. Whether it's through the regeneration process, whether it's through our marriage ministry, whether it's in our life groups, you will hear us who get this well say, I am the first to sin and I will admit it 
and I'm be humble about it, and I will ask you to hold me accountable for it. Yeah, so and I am not with pretending. That. Yeah, I'm not pretending to be something I'm not. Yeah, good stuff. I thought we might not get past this chapter. <laughs> yeah, it's a big one. It's a big deal. Uh, next week, let's uh, finish up with the gathering generational storm. We can do a little faster on that, I think. Yeah, um, uh, the gathering storm about the engines of culture. There's Again. a lot there. Yeah, that, yeah. We, can, we can go yes. through fast. Yes. Um, and then the gathering storm over religious liberty um, is the end. Um, those kind of cohere, those three. Yeah, and, and he ends with a conclusion. If you've read most of the book but you haven't read the conclusion, please read the conclusion. Uh, absolutely. Because the conclusion my wife and I were talking about this is like, well, are we just gonna, well, what are we saying that we're just mad about everything? I mean, cause at one point it sort of feels that way. Well, it feels like, it feels like it's nothing but doom and gloom. Right. Not, not so much that we're mad, but that it feels sure. like doom and gloom it's because he's, inevitable. he's unpacking right. what has been going on. Right. So in the conclusion, he gets to what Christians can do, faith, hope, and love. He fleshes that out yeah. and he ends with a, a call to love one another love our neighbor and love our enemies yeah and, and and i love i think it's his last line that says in in the end jesus promised i will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it mm -hmm. and he ends by saying and that's enough and he's right that's enough at the end of the day apparently so finish the book if you read three quarters of it finish it <laughs> yeah yes because because so much of it feels doom and gloomy but i think it's descriptive more than prescriptive it is throughout yeah and then this final part is about the only prescriptive part in it yeah um so one more week of gathering storm join us next week thanks for being with us for b b and b and b for such an easy topic <laughs>